Colby, it's Halloween, we haven't decorated our room yet. I'm way ahead of you. Colby, those are Christmas lights. They're festive. Yeah, but they're not spooky. I like spooky, that's scary. Oh, I'll make you like spooky. And even if the spooky gets you scary, you'll forget how scary you are because of how spooky the spook are! Wait, don't leave. Why not? I wanted you to like them before I told you this, but... I may have sold your soul to Satan for the lights. I, th I thought you would really like the lights. I did it for you. It's so sweet. But you can't just sell somebody else's soul to Satan. He's an honest businessman. He wouldn't like- I forged your signature. <laughs> Are you a demon? Best you can get on 20 bucks. You spend $20 on that? Spend most of the budget on catering. What do you want with me? Satan is prepared to release your soul on one condition. What's that? Oh. Ugh. What's this? Satan wants you to play Pandora's Tower. As a punishment? Is it bad? It's not really sure. You heard about it one trap and never got around to it. He's a big fan of Operation Rainfall, but he was kind of burnt out after the last story. So just. Play. Document your findings in video format. Shorter than 15 minutes. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if I can do that. I tend to ramble a lot. That's, that's fine. I mean, like, I just have a really hard time summarizing the things that I want to say really quickly, just you know? Take as much time as you <laughs> I mean, like, usually when I write something, like, it goes on way too long. Enough! Okay. Any last words? Yeah, just one thing. What is that? This is really contrived. You wrote it. Back at the beginning of the Rainfall Trilogy, nobody could stop talking about Xenoblade. There was so much buzz surrounding its release, and the reviews were so unanimously positive that it was considered a real feather in Rainfall's cap. The buzz carried over to the last story as well. Not only was it localized after one of the greatest games that we had to offer, it was being made by the creator of Final Fantasy. However, this is where things went wrong. Reviewers were none too kind with the last story, and it wound up having a far smaller impact than Xenoblade. So what did this mean for Pandora's Tower? While Xseed did eventually bring the game overseas, the fervor was dead. Pandora's Tower was developed by Ganbarian, a studio that had only done One Piece games, and this was their shot at creating an original franchise that could make them a household name. Unfortunately, being new to the game meant there was barely any hype, and it didn't help that it was released at the end of the Wii's lifespan. It was also too mature for kids, but too waifu for your grandparents, and that was the Wii's entire clientele. Pandora's Tower was so obscure that when I got it from GameStop, nobody had any idea what it was and thought that I was asking for an entirely different game. If I hadn't pre-ordered it, there probably wouldn't have been any in stock. The complete disinterest the world had in this game cloaked it in mystery. All I really knew about it going in was that it was some kind of action RPG with a time element. I didn't read any reviews, but the scores hovered around the last stories. How good could it possibly be? Pandora's Tower is a hard game for me to classify, but I think I'm most comfortable stating that it's definitely more of an action puzzle game than an RPG. It blends elements of Castlevania, Shadow of the Colossus, and, uh... Dating Sims? Into the tale of a young soldier, Eren, <laughs> who has to clear 13 towers in order to stop his lover, Elena, from turning into a cursed beast. The world is much smaller than either Xenoblade or The Last Story. Gameplay is split between the observatory that you're using as a hiding place and the towers that Eren must clear in order to obtain 13 pieces of Master Flesh, which Elena must eat to remove her curse. They're joined by Mavda, a member of the Gypsy Vestra race, who runs a shop and gives them information on the towers. In the observatory, you can rest, shop, upgrade, build your relationship with Elena, and prepare to take on the towers. While in the towers, the game becomes what I can only describe as an action puzzle platformer. While you have several main weapons that you can swap out to your liking, you'll always have the Arachlos chain equipped, which is necessary for climbing, solving puzzles, pulling levers, and fighting enemies. Each tower is essentially a large puzzle. You have to figure out how to reach each of the locks that are holding massive chains in front of the Tower Master's door, and the fight against each master is a Zelda-esque puzzle. There's a large variety in the mechanics you use both in the towers and against the bosses, though every fight ends with you plucking out the piece of Master Flesh that Elena needs. While you're inside the towers, time passes in the form of a round gauge in the bottom left. When the gauge starts changing color, Elena's curse mark has begun transforming her. If it fully depletes, she is now a beast and it's game over. The only way to gain more time is to feed her flesh, though it doesn't necessarily have to be the Master Flesh. 
Many of the monsters you fight in each tower will give you flesh worth varying amounts of time. You can usually tell how useful flesh is by how disgusting the name is. While you're in the observatory, your primary objective is to build your relationship with Elena by talking to her, giving her gifts you either craft, find, or buy from Avda, and giving her the flesh that she needs to live. How strong your relationship is determines which ending of the game you get, with the best ending earned by maximum affection. Well, best being subjective. You can do any of this in pretty much any order you want. If you're going for the better endings, you spend a lot of time in the observatory building a relationship, but you can just blaze through the towers if that's what you prefer. You even get a little freedom when it comes to what order you do the towers in. And, further adding to that freedom, Pandora's Tower has one of the best New Game Plus systems ever. Upon completing the game, you are now able to go back and resume your file from any chapter, so that you can go for 100% completion and other endings without having to slog all the way through the beginning of the game again. Alright, let's get this game started! How am I supposed to play this? <laughs> Immediately, the game catches my interest. The opening cutscenes move swiftly, and it doesn't take long to establish the scenario. Right off the bat, the montage tells you the story of Elena's curse and introduces you to our trio of characters. It's actually fantastic to see the huge festival in this bustling society. You get a real sense of the ideal life that Elena lost, and it gives you context for all of the references to her past that she makes throughout the game. Looking back on it, I am a little sad that we don't get to see more of this world, because all of the details are there. As I found notes in the observatory and learned more about the world from Mavda and Elena, I realized how much work was actually put into building Illyria. I understand why we don't see more of it, and frankly the game would have lost focus if we did go exploring. Elena needs to hide from the world right now, and the fear of being found makes the observatory feel like the eye of a hurricane, which does wonders for the atmosphere. The observatory is kind of run down and spooky itself, but it has some beautiful spots, and as Elena fixes it up, it actually gets a little cozy. The towers themselves have a great atmosphere, and the first five are very distinct. The second five, unfortunately, feel like a repeat of the first round, both in art direction and in gameplay. But the rest of the towers are substantially different in every aspect. The art direction is one of my favorite parts of the game, actually. The use of color throughout is fantastic, and the character models are great. When Elena transforms, it's absolutely sickening in the best ways. The design of the normal monsters is forgettable, but made up for with the master's designs. Each master not only looks unique, but has to be outsmarted and weakened in a different way before you can get at its flesh. There are a few that aren't as interesting and exciting as the rest, but overall, the roster of bosses in Pandora's Tower is more interesting than most action games, including several of the Zelda titles. Combat with normal monsters is a bit murkier. Most monsters barely flinch when you hit them and can soak up a lot of attacks. Thankfully, you don't need to fight them much. As long as you have some flesh to give Elena, there's no reason to waste any more of your valuable time fighting monsters when you can just run past them and focus on solving the puzzles. There are a few rooms where you have to beat a group of enemies to proceed, but they're few and far between. Pandora's Tower is not a game about fighting monsters, and the design itself reflects that. For the first time in JRPG history, wasting time grinding monsters is actually not necessary. You do get experience and level up by fighting them, but honestly, it's kind of pointless. Most of the RPG elements are pretty unimportant. You get a strength and health boost by leveling, but you can clear the whole game at a low level. It just takes more time. You can also choose between a couple different weapons and spend resources leveling them up, but again, it's more of a helpful boost than a crucial gameplay element. I kind of like it. The developers saw that the point of the game was to take care of Elena, and anything that doesn't directly assist that goal takes a back seat. It's interesting that, even when you're in the towers, the game is still driven by Elena. The entire time I was exploring and solving puzzles, I was keeping an eye on the time and weighing my priorities. Did I have enough time to break another lock, or did I need to head back now to prevent disaster? It was nice to develop my own flow when it came to progressing through the towers. I established a tradition of exploring and learning the map on my first run, finishing the locks on a second, and going in a third time to fight the master with a full time gauge. Nothing was stopping me from going about my business the way that I felt best. I really enjoyed the controls as well. For the most part, motion controls didn't matter. The nunchuck controlled movement and the fixed camera angles meant that they could make the most out of the limited buttons on the Wiimote. The only time the motion controls were used was with the chain. Simply point at the screen to start aiming and press the B button to fire. Holding the B button down also slows down time and lets you aim precisely, which does wonders for counteracting the natural shakiness you get from using the controller. 
The most satisfying thing in the combat system is definitely yanking out Master Flesh, as it should be. By shooting the chain into the flesh and pulling back, you can slowly do damage as you build up your chain's meter. When it's full, just rip it out by jerking the Wiimote back. It's... it's basically Manhunt, guys. I think I'm a killer now. You can also use the Wii's Classic Controller if you want, but honestly, I think this might be the first time where that's actually the inferior control method. I actually thought the story for Pandora's Tower would be somewhere around Last Story's level, but it surpassed it tremendously. It starts off simple enough, but what really makes it great is the actual quality of the scenario. I don't want to give away any specific details, but the ending that I got the first time was a total emotional gut punch. It was beautiful, and the storytelling was so well paced that it kept me actively engaged. Even though Pandora's Tower is a little shorter than the last story, it feels much more complete, and the writing is chief among the reasons I found Pandora's Tower to be one of my favorite experiences on the Wii. This is fantastic! How come nobody played this? Did just nobody review it? Oh. People reviewed it. Were they bad reviews? Take a look. <laughs> oh god! Oh god! Oh. Yeah. Reviewers were actually harsher on Pandora's Tower than the last story. I mean, uh, clearly I disagree, but as much as I'd like to just say no for the sake of fairness, I'm gonna take these criticisms one by one and deconstruct them. A common complaint is that the action is lackluster, that the combat doesn't have the spark or shine that games like Devil May Cry or God of War have. I agree, but I don't think that's an overwhelmingly bad thing. Devil May Cry and God of War are action epics that place you in control of a massively powerful superhuman. They're about hunting demons and killing gods, so of course the combat is going to be balls out ridiculous. That's great for those games, but that's not what Pandora's Tower is. Eren's mission isn't to be a badass, it's to save his lover. The game is called Pandora's Tower as an obvious nod to Pandora's box, as in Eren is leaping into the overwhelming evil to try and clutch the little bit of hope that lies at the end. He's a normal guy against supernatural forces. That makes him a little impotent. Honestly, avoiding combat is the best plan of action most of the time. Making killing monsters slick and fun, in my opinion, would distract the player from their actual mission. There's also a common complaint that the camera makes things difficult. Personally, I'm a fan of a locked camera when I think that it actually adds to the experience, like in Devil May Cry or Resident Evil. I feel the fixed camera angles in Pandora's Tower are basically the developer's ways of helping convey the puzzles to you. It focuses your attention on one wall or side of the room so that you can get a feel for what you're supposed to be doing. There are also a few other things brought up, like a distaste for the art direction and voice acting, but there are also reviewers who like those things, so it's really just a manner of taste. Overall, the most frustrating complaint I saw was something a few reviewers echoed. A lot of them had an issue with Elena. Not that she was badly done, but that she brings the game down because it interferes with the real gameplay, which is exploring the towers and fighting monsters. To me, this is completely missing the point of the game. If maintaining your relationship with Elena isn't your thing, that's fine. But suggesting that it be removed or made a side quest is simply taking away the heart of the title. It's like saying, Man, I sure enjoy Mass Effect, but I wish they'd stop this annoying political crap so I could get back to shooting the Geth. There are a number of actually valid complaints. Pandora's Tower is not the most visually successful game, and its taste is so specific that I can understand how it wouldn't appeal to everyone. But it feels like very few reviewers really gave it an honest shot. Out of all the major reviews I read online, IGN and Nintendo Life are the only ones who I felt really gave Pandora's Tower a fair shot, even though they only scored it out of 7. Even they, however, didn't hit on what I think is the best quality Pandora's Tower has to offer. Theming. Themes are something found in almost every artistic medium. Now, to an extent, every game has themes because they exist everywhere, but true theming is much harder to find. For the purpose of this video, I'm gonna say that theming is the process of building a game around a particular topic or question. For example, Heavy Rain. For all its flaws, Heavy Rain does theming very well. The question in mind is how far you'd go to save someone, and the gameplay forces you to make a myriad of tough decisions around this premise. Out of the Rainfall trilogy, I would say Pandora's Tower is tied the most significantly into its theme. Chikako Yamakura, who produced and designed the scenario for Pandora's Tower, says it's about true love. How strong is true love, and how much can it really overcome? It might sound similar to the themes in several other games, like Shadow of the Colossus, but there's a fantastic twist on the scenario in this case. In most games, whoever you're trying to save is helpless, or kidnapped, or in some way removed from the situation, leaving you with all the power. 
In Pandora's Tower, however, Elena is very much around, very much alive, and incredibly dangerous. At any moment, her curse could churn and she could tear you apart. This places an incredible strain on the relationship. Elena is the person Aaron loves, and the one that you want to save. The game does a great job at building your affinity with her through random conversations and events that feel spontaneous and not entirely scripted. And so many of the interactions between the two are determined by your own actions and random luck that it builds differently every playthrough. The dialogue does bear some of the traits that a lot of video game scripts have, with a couple lines that feel forced and inorganic at times, but I think that the way it's presented is a cut above the average RPG. I will say, however, that having Eren as a mostly silent protagonist weakens this effect. I understand that silent protagonists allow the player to feel like they have more agency in the story, but Eren isn't entirely silent. He has a line now and then, and even when he's quiet, he often shows his own emotions and reactions to the situation. He is very much a real character with personality, which makes it odd that he speaks so little to his significant other. Despite this, the game establishes what I think is a very interesting dichotomy with Elena. A lot of people say that she's a boring, one-dimensional character, but I disagree. It is true that she's overwhelmingly sweet most of the time, but those people exist in life. They aren't an inhuman construct visible only in media. In a game as dark as Pandora's Tower, Elena exists as a beacon of pure light. She sees the good in every situation. This contrasts so heavily with the beast of pure destruction that the curse is turning her into, and that's where I think her depth lies. She knows that she's carrying this horrible darkness inside of her, and she struggles with that through the whole game. She hits so many different notes, clinging to the past and reminding Eren of good times, telling Eren to leave her, stealing herself to help out and ensure their future together. To call her one-dimensional just because she's nice is to misinterpret what character depth actually is. Elena is, in my eyes, a very accurate representation of a good person who finds themselves a threat to those they love. The most compelling exploration of the game's theme, in my opinion, slowly builds throughout the middle of the game, and it revolves around the Master Flesh itself. As a follower of Ios, Elena has gone her entire life without eating meat. The first time she has to eat flesh, it's a struggle to get through one bite. After a few pieces, she starts looking forward to it, and licking her lips like a cartoon. Eren notices, and though he doesn't say anything, his expression tells us enough. The person that he's going through hell for is changing, in ways that scare him. Out of all the games that ask you to save your loved one, I have a hard time naming any where the protagonist starts doubting whether they should save them, or whether they still love them. Could you picture Mario sitting down to weigh his priorities before entering Bowser's castle? This is what makes Pandora's Tower so uncomfortably dark. The flesh-eating scenes and transformations are disturbing, sure, but what really put me on edge was the uncertainty about this relationship I was trying to save. I felt a sense of dread. I suggest reading the Iwata Asks interview for Pandora's Tower. It provides a lot of great insight into the development process, and the way Chikako developed the game shows why it was themed so well. I think it's very telling that the Japanese version of the game has a subtitle, Until I Return to Your Side. It perfectly sums up the entire point of the game. They also made other subtle changes, such as remodeling Elena's transform state near the end of development because they realized that she looked too cool as a half-monster, and they wanted players to have no feelings towards her fate other than pity. Overall, the game was designed with its theme and story at the forefront, and it pays off in an incredibly rewarding tale, especially if you get the A ending. I know the S ending is considered the best because it's the happiest, but frankly, it feels... out of place. I don't want to spoil the plot for everyone because of how powerful it is, but let's just say that the A ending is the one that best embodies the theme. They're all available on YouTube if you want to see them for yourself. Pandora's Tower has flaws. I can't deny that the action and camera feel a bit archaic. While that may have been a conscious choice that brings benefits, a lot of gamers are used to slick, fluid action games. To me, it didn't matter. The point of the game wasn't to rack up stylish combos like Devil May Cry, so I didn't see the point in comparing the two. In my opinion, far too many reviewers got stuck on elements that bore similarities to other games and refused to look at how combining those elements made a unique experience. How are developers supposed to create new franchises when they're just going to be ruthlessly compared to what already exists? I didn't care if the dungeons were as compelling as the best Zelda has to offer, or if the action was as flashy as God of War, because Pandora's Tower offered an experience that those games couldn't give me. Who cares if you're trying to save someone close to you like in Shadow of the Colossus? The context is entirely different. Out of all the Rainfall games, this one was the most compelling to me. The only one of the bunch that gave me a real motivator and interesting story that didn't feel in some sense familiar. I adore Xenoblade, and it's my favorite to play of the three because it hits all of my personal sweet spots. But if I'm forced to pit all these games against each other purely as memorable experiences, I would have to give it to Pandora's Tower. Yes, there were things that could have been improved. 
but it tried something new, and it was so bold in that choice that it left an impact. This is why I hate rating systems, and why I never personally review games on a point scale. There are so many games that fail in the graphical department or have some clunky mechanics that have a gripping storyline or offer a unique experience. I would rather play those than an extremely polished game that offers nothing unique but scores a 9 off of its structure. The last story had all of the technical parts correct, the graphics were great and the combat was really fluid, but it failed to find something really compelling to pull me through. And that's what makes a game worth it to me. Final Fantasy IX has a lot of issues when it comes to its gameplay, but the story is so wonderfully told that it has a firm group of fans who consider it among their favorite games, myself included. It is so incredibly unimportant to me that the camera was annoying a handful of times, or that the upgrade system wasn't entirely necessary, when I compare it to the good Gambarian pulled off with Pandora's Tower. If you give in to the experience they were trying to create, and actually let yourself care about Elena instead of whining that you don't like clingy girls, you can get a lot out of this game. If that's not what you want, and you're looking for a smoother, more action-packed game, that's perfectly fine. It just irritates me that virtually none of the reviewers mentioned the things that Pandora's Tower did right, and treated it like it was an inferior version of games that it was never trying to be. Pandora's Tower is not for everyone, but it deserved a larger fanbase and more credit than what it got. Hey, demon! What? Where's your manager? What do you mean? Where's Satan? I want to talk to him. Satan wasn't in the budget. I don't care, I'll just I'll edit him in. We'll do a crappy. Haven't you already been doing that? You stick to the script. I made your career, I can end it. Why have you called me here? So I can thank you for letting me play Pandora's Tower. Wait, was it good? <laughs> yeah, it was great. But I heard the combat was terrible. Okay, sure, you don't rip people in half or leap 20 feet like Kratos or Dante, but Eren isn't a god or a demon. He's a human, like me and you, and that's what makes him so relatable. But the game's design contradicts itself. Why should I have to take care of some clingy girl? What, are you 12? No! That's the point of the game. The design doesn't contradict itself because it's not about killing monsters. It's about saving the one you care about most. Haven't you ever lost anyone, Satan? What would you have given to save them? Who is your Elena? Who is it? Nobody. I'm Satan. Okay, look, what I'm trying to say is that, sure, Pandora's Tower has its faults. It gets a little repetitive, some of the puzzles are too obscure, but that's so minor! Wait. So many games like Zelda, Infamous, and Assassin's Creed have issues like this, but they get universal praise. But Our culture is so closed off to content that takes risks that none of the reviewers could even fathom that this might be a game that tries something original. They just kept comparing it to games it was never trying to be. The hey. reviewers got so caught up in the camera angles sometimes being annoying that they didn't even point out the things that make it a compelling, unique experience. They were so caught up in bad camera angles or mediocre monster designs that they didn't realize the depth of the story or the compelling themes or anything that made Pandora's Tower compelling. That is something that's hard to come across. Okay, fine, I'll let you go. Just stop talking. Hey, can I keep the Christmas lights? Sure, whatever. Oh, thanks, Satan, you rock. Hey everybody, it's Chris here. Thanks for sticking with me through the Rainfall Trilogy. It's been such a long time since I started this, but I feel like I really have a good grasp of what I want Jack all to be now. I'm really happy with where the show's going, and even though there's so much stuff I still have to fix, just the response I've been getting while working on this has been fantastic. I'm not entirely sure what the next episode's going to be, but I'm gonna have a big project going on in November that's completely unrelated to Jack all, so just stay tuned for that. Follow me on Twitter if you want more constant updates about what I'm working on. And if you want to help me take my shows to the next level, please consider checking out my Patreon. Thanks for watching, and stay awesome.